But Paul always seemed to have a pattern of which when he landed in the city, he always found a synagogue to go to. He started, the one thing Paul would do when he would start with the people who already had some familiarity with the scripture, he would win those to win as many of those to Christ because they had the ability as they stayed there to make a difference in other people's lives. So it said that there was a, there was a synagogue of the Jews and as Paul was, uh, as, and, and, and then it says, as his manner was, this is his process, this is what he did. He went into them, and three days Sabbath, Sabbath reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Pay attention to that one phrase right there. Reasoned with them out of the scriptures. So a couple of things you need to notate out of this, all right? One of the, what was as his normal manner, his normal operating, standard operating procedure basically was this. Paul goes into a city, he finds a synagogue, why does he do that? And Paul starts with familiarity, he starts with familiar ground. He always starts with something that he can go in and make a difference in and start to reason why, start to really work from the ground up. Why would Paul want to do that? Well, number one, Paul was accepted among the Jews. Number one, Paul was a great, uh, was a great Jewish Pharisee. I mean, he knew the scriptures, he understood the scriptures. He could reason the scriptures. He could speak of them. He had a reputation for even the education in which he had. So when Paul came in, uh, when Paul came into the scene, he was given, basically what happened was when he walked into the synagogue in one of these cities, they, through his own reputation, would give him the pulpit. Now, I think after about two or three days of him having the pulpit, they wound up regretting it, but at the same time, they gave him the pulpit. That they gave him a platform in order for him to fulfill his purpose. Now, I want you to understand what he would do with this once he got that. So he was three Sabbath days. In other words, he was, basically what he did was he spent three weeks right here, right here with them. He was right there in the midst of them teaching. Now, what did he do with them? He reasoned with them out of Scripture. Notice the blanket of his, the, the paradigm and the platform of his argument. It wasn't opinion, it wasn't politics, it wasn't, it wasn't anything. It was based on Scripture and Scripture alone. Folks, listen to me and listen to me well. The only thing that we'll ever be able to stand on and rest assured of is Scripture. I am more assured of this one thing than I am anything else in all my, re in, in all my days of living as a preacher is that I can't count on not one thing as a reliable source of information other than my Bible. That is, I, listen, I don't care what the CDC puts out, I don't buy it. I don't care what the public health puts out, not, it's not selling to me. I, don't, I definitely don't want to hear what kind of article the news media puts out. I don't care if it's CNN, Fox News, or whatever. I'm not buying it anymore. I don't know, I, it don't matter what, I, I don't care what somebody posts on Facebook. I, when I, oh, this is the only standard that I've got right now. And the only thing that I'm going to put my confidence in right now and that I read is the, is the concept of Scripture. But the one thing I do know is this, is that the Scripture will guide me to truth. The Scripture is true. It will lead me. It will direct me. It will help me. And it is what I can totally put my confidence in. And the thing that we need to realize is Paul understood something great right here. He understood a great principle about winning people to Christ. Psalms 19 teaches us that the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. One of the things that burdens me the most about the modern American church is this, is that the majority of the American church sitting in our churches today have no way of scripturally, have no knowledge of how to scripturally maneuver somebody through the salvation experience. I don't have a problem with somebody being able to share their testimony. Matter of fact, I think that's one of the most important things that we can start with sharing with one another. How you got saved could be a great way of how somebody else got saved. But you are not going to always be able to just rely on a personal testimony in what order to help somebody into a, into a matter of salvation. The fact of the matter is, is we've got to be able to utilize Scripture so that it can, rather than reason opinion, 
rather than not rather than reason with religion, rather than reason with uh, with, with 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 social status, rather than reason with with logic or philosophy. You've got to be able to reason out of the scriptures. The scriptures is where we're going to get the foundation from. God's word will do its job way better than we ever thought about doing. Why is it so important that we make, make note of this right here? Is the fact that Paul didn't come in and try to push a philosophy, did he? Paul didn't come in and he didn't have a political agenda. Paul didn't come in and he didn't have a... Paul literally, and I want to notate this really quick as it crossed my mind, Paul didn't even have an intention of changing society. Paul's intention was not to fix society. His intention was to preach the gospel. No matter where he was, what he was doing, his number one goal was to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because if you can change the heart of a man, then if you change the heart of enough, enough of them, then guess what it's going to do to society? A lot of times we have flipped the script in our worlds today and we want to try to fix society without changing the heart. We want to fix the society. We want to fix the community. But the thing about it is, is you, 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 can't, you can't polish the mirror, folks. You can't do it. You can't just sit there. You can't, you can't just sit there and polish the outside of it and think that it's going to fix it when down deep inside there's a heart issue that's, that, that, that's going on. And the realization that Paul had was this, is I'm not coming in to try to fix the city. I'm coming in to share the gospel. I, my platform is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. My goal is to share Jesus and tell the, to tell the gospel story so that man can hear it, believe, and be saved. And when revival takes place, guess what it's going to do to the community? When people get saved, a heart change happens, so therefore a life change happens. And when a life change happens, a community change happens. Happens every time. Every time you see it in Scripture. And so what did he do? He reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. His argument was always biblical. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. in, other words, in other words, he didn't just say, well... I don't see it that way. You know, one of the greatest devastations I think that we've encountered is the fact that we have, we have somehow or another mingled the old wives' tales and what we've learned on the back porch sipping iced tea and drinking hot coffee and, and, uh, and grandpa's old philosophies that sound really good when they've been thrown in the air. But they don't always line up with Scripture. Now listen to me. If you're going to reason out of Scripture, you better get ready to be countercultural. You better get ready to go against the flow of what the culture of this world is wanting to go against. And so Paul had an argument, and the, the one thing that he did right here was when it was so important that we understand that he utilized Scripture as the basis of all of his arguments. He didn't walk in and say, Here's what I believe. He walked in and he says, this is what the scriptures say. There's a difference. I've heard it said oftentimes, said, said, don't get mad at me, get mad at the Bible. If you're going to get mad at me, you don't have to get mad at the Bible because I'm not telling you what I think. I'm telling you what the Bible says. So, Paul went in his like manner. Guess what he did? Not only, he did it in the synagogues, but he also did it out of Scripture. He always used Scripture as the platform in which he built it off of. Not an opinion, not a, not a, not a big, huge uh, uh, display of, of some sort of entertainment session. He did it using Scripture. Now, what did he do from there? In verse number 3, opening and alleging that Christ must needs and have suffered and risen again. This is his message. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, that this, that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Why is that so important? Because the Jews did not believe. The Jews were still waiting for a Messiah when the Messiah had already come. You gotta understand this, that the Jews were not happy when they already talked about when they felt uh, the Jews were very convicted to their core that when they realized that they were the ones that crucified the very Christ that they've been looking for. 
Some of them believed and repented. Other ones got mad and turned to envy and persecution. So he, 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 he alleged and opened that Christ must need suffer and is risen again from the dead. And that Jesus, whom he preached, whom I preach to you, is Christ. Now, here's the same thing that we'll always see in verse number 4. <coughs> and some of them believed. That's a blessing, isn't it? Isn't it good to know that you can share the gospel over and over and over again? And some will believe. And they consorted with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. So this wasn't just uh, this wasn't just a few. So a whole bunch of people just believed, right? I, I, I kind of get a chuckle when I read that verse a little bit, and it said, and some of them believed, and then at the end of it, it said, and not a few. So I'm beginning to wonder what the Bible counts as a sum. I'm not really sure that number. It said, and some of them believed, and what they were talking about, and some of them believed, and guess what they did? They, they consorted with Paul and Silas. In other words, they kept asking questions. You've got to understand that Paul, Paul and Silas didn't just, just share the gospel, but he also discipled them <coughs> while they were there. It says, and it was of devout, uh, 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 of devout Greeks. So here's some Greeks that were on the fringe right here. They were there. You had, your, you, you had Paul and Silas going in the synagogues and starting with the scriptures of those that had a knowledge of scripture. But then you had some Greeks that were on the fringe that was ready to get rid of their old, uh, their, 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 their gods of idolatry. And they were ready, to, they were looking for something, they were looking for answers, they were looking for, the, they were looking for God. And, and, and then there was the chief women. Some of these women that were, that were high up on the social total pole, so to speak. They got saved. They believed. Now, verse 5. Verse 5, we go on in. And it says, that, uh, but the Jews, which believe not. Now, I would be okay if somebody didn't. It's, it's one thing to just believe not. That's burdensome enough, right? But here's the deal. is a lot of times you don't get somebody that just wants to disagree with you and then move on and say, well, we're not, we, can't, we can't agree on this. Let's just move on with life. Usually when somebody has a disagreement with you, they either, if they can't win you, they're going to hurt you. Did y'all hear that? When somebody don't like you or disagrees with you, if they can't win you, then their goal is to hurt you. I have been the encounter of some of that stuff before. If I can't win you over to my side and make you see the way I see and you can't see the way I see, so what my goal is is rather than let's just move on and you live your life and I live mine and everything goes on and we can live like we want to live and you do as you want to and I can do my life. Most of the time what's going to happen when somebody doesn't agree with you rather than, than just agree to disagree, their goal is to hurt you. Because the ones that believe not were moved with envy. Why were they so moved with envy? Because they were seeing the effects of what these two was having. These two newcomers were having on the scene. Now, what did they do? They could have handled it themselves. But they took, and I love the way the King James uses this language right here. They, because I don't use this language. I, I, but I need to use, I, I don't even think many people would understand. I, I, if somebody called me lewd, I would wonder if they were giving me a compliment or not. But it said this, it took with them certain lewd fellows. In other words, these were not great people. Matter of fact, they would be considered the bottom of the barrel, the meanest of the meanest, the roughest of the roughest. They were the ones out there that you could pay very little money and they would try to hurt you. All right? They took very loose fellas. They convinced them, pulled them together, loose fellas. And it says this, and, and, and moving forward in verse number five, loose fellas of the baser sort. In other words, what that means is the lower level curve people. This was not necessarily just what you call economically low. This was morally low. It, it, this had not to do, when it says of the baser sort, it wasn't saying that the baser sort is necessarily saying these are the low people, like uh, economically low. These are the people that were lewd. In other words, they were immoral, they were unjust, they were wicked as hell, and they were of the baser sort. In other words, they were the lowest moral compass that you could find. That's what they were. 
They had no moral compass, so anything was game in their but in their in their eyes. And what they did was they gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar to assault to assault them. It said it assaulted the house of Jason. Now, why is the house of Jason so important? This was most likely, based on what I see and what I've interpreted, is probably a place where Paul and Silas was staying. Based on what they were giving me and what we're going to read here in just a minute, this was most likely. It sought to bring them out to the people. So in other words, they took captive of the, of the house of the Jews. They took captive of Jason. Why? Not because they wanted Jason. They wanted Paul and Silas. You want to know why? We're about to see why. If there's one thing you want to get out of this text about anything, verse 6 is where we need to get to. It says that when they found them not, they drew Jason... And certain brethren unto the rulers of the city crying, These, listen to this, listen to this, these that have the have turned the world upside down are come hither also. If you take notes in the margin of your Bible, I want you to write down the same thing I did. What a awesome testimony. What an awesome testimony. <laughs> We're talking about the, the most lewd, immoral, uh, horrendous, depraved individuals you could possibly gather. We're talking about people that did not care if you lived, didn't care if you died, didn't care if you bled. I'm talking about mean as junkyard dog mean. And their testimony of Paul and Silas was these people that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. And I wonder today, with as many Christians as we have in America right now, why we don't have that same opinion, not the same testimony. Not among the believers, but among the heathen. The people that are world changers. There's only two guys right here, Paul and Silas. Timothy's right there in the midst of them, but he, he, you don't see or see much of him. He's along just watching and listening. Paul and Silas, Paul is mainly the talker out of the group. And here's the deal. Is the re is, is what their testimony was, was the fact of the matter is, is they were the ones that turned the world upside down. So in other words, when they walked in and their presence was made known and they walked into a city, guess what they did? They did not leave it the same way they found it. Lives were changed. Communities were altered. In other words, they were so full of the Holy Ghost and so full of God and so passionate about the things of God, they wasn't worried about a dime. They wasn't worried about, they wasn't worried about politics. They wasn't worried about social status. They wasn't worried about political power. They wasn't worried about who liked them and who didn't like them, who was with them and who were not with them. Their number one goal was the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they knew that the gospel is the power of God and the salvation to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. We know that because Paul said that in Romans chapter 1. We know what the power of the gospel can do. We know what the power of scripture can do. We know what God can do when he moves in the heart of somebody. And their goal was this. I don't want your applause. I don't care if you beat me. I don't care if you hurt me. I don't care if you like me. All I want you to do is get Jesus. And if you get Jesus, that's all that matters. And by doing that, guess what they did? City by city, person by person, they got a reputation of the men that turned the world upside down. <laughs> Two men had that kind of reputation. And here in Blount County, well, this is going to stink. we got churches on every corner and can't make a bend. You know why? Because meth is still pumped faster than anything you can imagine. 70 children right now in DHR care. Not to mention what they what they haven't got their hands on yet, what they haven't got a record of this year. Who are the relatives? Are living with relatives. This many churches, this close together, and we're not even making a bend. Which 
Which means to tell me this. Are we really a church? Or we become more of a social club? Church members change the world. Club members never change anything. It's a burden. But I pray that one day we're able to have such a testimony. It says that they come hither also. In other words, they've been in your house, Jason. They've been up in here with you, whom Jason has received. And all these do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, one Jesus. Well, yes, there is another king. And yes, his name is Jesus. It says in verse number 8, it says, And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. In other words, they caused a stir of slander. Slander. In verse number 9, it says, And when they had taken security of Jason and the other, they let them go. Now watch this. And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas by night in Berea, who coming thither went into a synagogue of the Jews. Did y'all hear what he just did? You think, <laughs> you think Paul figured this out by now, wouldn't you? I have figured it out that Paul was this guy that loved to poke bears. All right? I have figured it out that Paul really did not give a rip. I think he drank about, about a 40-ounce bottle of it every morning before he drank, wake, woke up that all I care about. Wouldn't it be good if we lived in such a manner that all we cared about was our relationship with Jesus Christ? And all that mattered to him was his relationship with Jesus Christ. He left one city after being nearly killed in one, and then guess what he did? You, you would think after synagogue, after synagogue, persecution after persecution, jail after jail, you know what? Maybe I've not got the best paradigm of doing things. That's the way we would think. But Paul had a whole other ball game. He said, look, I'm, I went into Berea. Guess what? I found a synagogue. Let's go back and reason in Scripture again. And reason out of Scripture. So he did that. He said, uh, it says this, and these were more noble <laughs> than those of Thessalonica. In other words, these are a little better folks to deal with. I guess God gave him a little bit, bit of relief. It says this, it says, in that, the, in, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily for that these things were so. Isn't that a blessing to hear? Now, I want, I want to commend these that are in the synagogue for just a second. They didn't just buy it at face value, did they? A lot of times, it, I, I, I think they did the right thing. I, I, I want to commend them right here for this. They received the word with readiness of mind. They were eager to receive what they were being taught by Paul. But it says that they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so or not. In other words, they didn't just take Paul's word for it, did they? They searched the scriptures themselves to see. A lot of times we get, we, you know, Catholicism said that Catholicism has the priest that stands up and says, you don't have to do it yourself. You just have to listen to me. And the reality of it is that somehow or another Christians in today's society, especially in America, have bought on to that. Well, if the preacher says it, then I can just buy into what the preacher says. I don't have to read it for myself. That's hogwash. God didn't get, God gave me the Holy Spirit, but I guarantee you this, if you got saved, you got him too. And the Bible tells me that the Holy Spirit has the ability to lead us to all truth. All right? So what does that tell me? If I've got the Holy Spirit living inside me, i got a Bible I'm holding on to, then I can search the Scriptures myself to make sure that what He is saying is true. Because you're going to wind up in a church service somewhere. You're going to wind up listening to somebody online. You're going to hear something on the radio. And the Holy Spirit of God is going to go off inside your heart and go, ding, 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 that is false. That is false. And you're really not going to know, is it false or not? But it don't feel like, it don't sound right, it doesn't, it grieves my spirit a little bit. And so guess what you can do? You can pick your own Bible up, you can open the scriptures and say, is this right, Lord? And you begin to search the scriptures day in and day out, day in and day out. And guess what? You can figure it out for yourself, whether it's true or false. And I commend them for that. Said so they received with readiness of mind the word 
It says, and they search the scriptures daily, and it says this, it says in verse number 12, it says, therefore many of them believed. In the other city, guess what? Some of them believed. But they didn't say it was not a few, so there had to be a pretty good revival take place. I can only imagine how this one started, and it goes on to say, many of them believed, which were honorable women, which were Greeks. In other words, the Greek women were wiser than the Greek men, is what I'm getting, is what basically... Greek, uh, uh, which were the Greeks of the men, and it says, not a few. Holy smokes, everywhere they went, they had a revival. People got saved. People's lives changed. We're coming to a close here in just a second. We're moving through this. We're moving through this. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached, was preached to Paul at Riva, they came hither and stirred up the people. And immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, uh, go as it were to the sea. But, but Silas and Timothy, Tim, Tim, Timothy or Timaeus abode there still. And they that conducted uh, that conducted Paul brought him to Athens. And we're going to get we're, we're we're coming to a close. And receiving a commandment unto Paul and unto Silas and Timaeus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. So in other words, what happened was they sent him away to have Paul, sent Paul to Athens. Paul then sent notification there to uh, to Paul and Silas to tell them, to get over here quickly. Now watch this now, verse sixteen. This is uh, this is where we're going to close out. This is where we're going to close out. And while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw a city holy given. To idolatry. They waited for them at Athens. As he waited, his spirit was stirred when he saw a city wholly given to idolatry. Why is that so significant? I think you would sense the same thing in Susan Moore, Alabama. I think it sense the same thing in Bluff County. I think he would sense the same thing as he lived in the state of Alabama. Well, this is the Bible Belt that is given to idolatry. Can I tell y'all something? I'm going to give y'all something because y'all come on Wednesday night. You really want to know my humble opinion. I believe some of the greatest forms of idol worship takes place on Sunday mornings in our in our Baptist churches all across our world. Do they have monuments? No, we don't have little statues that we worship. Well, we do. They're called buildings. God forbid you change the paint on the wall in some of them, right? I, I thank God I don't have our pastor a church like that. But but they do, don't they? You ever, ever heard of a church splitting because somebody wanted to move something? You know what that is? It's called idol worship. Worshiping a monument rather than worshiping God. It's not the wall out so that people can have, we can see more people. No, my great-granddaddy built that wall. Yeah. Okay. So, was, I don't want it moved. The building wasn't meant to be. It's kind of like, it's kind of like our facility now. The one thing that it's been, that one thing that we, that I've tried to do, and in my mindset, try to do as much as I love this facility and I'm grateful for it. You want it to be used. Why? Why would we not want it to be used? It's not made to be looked at. And guess what? The hard thing about when you use something like this is, guess what? Things get tore up. Things get dirty. That's where you put fresh coats of paint on. That's where you come in and you fix it. Yes, but it's getting used. And thank God for it. But you know what? It's not just that we worship buildings. We worship positions. We worship positions. We worship places, yes. Places like buildings like this. We worship. We work, and, 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 it, and, and the reality of it is, is when you start to look at what Paul saw and how they dealt with idol worship, then you, then you see that they worship positions. Who has this? Who, who is it? This, who has this amount of money? Who, um, who has this? Who has that? Who does this? Who does that? And there's positions that that's idolatry. 
It's amazing at how a title can affect a person's mindset. One of the philosophies that I've dealt, that I've done, I've adopted in ministry over the years as a pastor, and it's taken me a few years to do, do, do this. If you're looking for a title, then it's a good possibility that you will get one. One of the great things when we were here, and I may have shared this with y'all, and you may have already heard me say this, but when we were doing the Blount County Revival meetings, and all of us were meeting together and discussing it, and it was there was uh, it was uh, it was several of us getting together, and as we get together, we would begin to discuss who get who is going who would get to preach, who was going to preach. Now, you put a group of preachers in a room together. Guess who want who, who wants to preach? All of them. And, and here's the deal: if they got any of it, if they're worth their weight in saying, I, I hope they would. But it, there's always one man, one message for the right time. And that was a burden on all of us. So we developed this philosophy. For those that may want the microphone, you don't get it. That was the philosophy we developed. For those that would rather divert it over. So in other words, when we had it here, one of the first things I did, I said, guys, y'all got it. I'm not, I'm, my hands are off. And that's the mindset we've got to have. We can't worship a position. We can't put ourselves in a position or a title or something like that. We can't always have the platform. Another thing that we see that we worship is power. Power. Power is an idol in today's society. We've got to have power. If I'm not in complete control, then I can't have it. One of the worst things that I see across our land is performance. One of the greatest forms of idolatry in American church today is the idol of performance. We've got to put on a show. It is a sad day in which we have lived where we have man-made, where we have a man-made manifestation of God rather than actual, the real manifestation. Why in the world does a church need fog and pretty light and all those lights flickering off? Why do they need? I mean, I was watching one the other day. There was fog everywhere. And I'm thinking, is this necessary? Oh, it was a good start. I mean, before I was, the, before, I, put, I was listening to music, foot was tapping and everything else. And I had to, I had to look around. And I was like, why is this all necessary? It's performance. Now look, if you get happy and want to bounce off every pew in this place, I'll bounce with you if we want to. But at the same time, there's a difference between get, getting, getting beside yourself full of the Holy Ghost and getting happy in that and then dealing with the performance up here. What we need now more than anything on planet Earth is rather than have talent, we need the touch of God. I don't, your church, Mount Pleasant Baptist Church don't need a businessman. They don't need a CEO. They don't need, they don't need that. What they need is a man of God or a group of men of God with a backbone like a saw log that will preach the Bible. I don't need a CEO that's going to, a CEO is not going to get my babies out of hell. A CEO is not going to change the community. A CEO ain't going to do that. But a Born again, filled with the Holy Ghost preacher will make a difference. Now, we don't need, we don't need the, uh, and, and that's what Paul, Paul was stirred. He said, this, this is a bunch of show. I can see him walking around. This is a show. He was an actor, rich. It was a show. It was a performance. Everything was. It stirred him in his spirit. It bothered him. I'm telling you, church, I'm bothered by that today. I'm bothered by the fact that, and here's the problem with being so entertainment driven. The problem is, is this, is when you have to entertain somebody to get them here, you have to entertain them to keep them here. And when it loses its luster and the entertainment drops off, it ain't going to be the it ain't going to be the Holy Ghost is what keeps them constant. It keeps them here. They're going to they're going to bounce from one place to the other to find what entertains them the most. That's the way it's going to work. In other words, here's the deal. Here's what's happening right now in the American church right now. This is I know I'm, I know it sounds like I'm chasing a chasing a rabbit, but the reality of it is it's idolatry. And we're losing churches. For I think for every one church that's birthed, there's probably I think there's three for every one church that is birthed in our 
in our country, there's three that close their doors. And that may be a greater statistic now after the whole COVID movement has taken place. It may have elevated that much more because COVID is shutting them all down. Well, COVID's not. People are. But that's another message for another day right there. But here's the reality of it is, is as, as those things are closing down, here's, what's, here's the reality. The church, what's happening is the fact that the church is trying to entertain. So what's happening is we're gauging our church growth off of a off of membership movement rather than entrance into the family of God. We're moving from one place to another, to another. That's why we've got all these mega churches out there. But the little churches have to do their part by going out and reaching people with the gospel. Places, positions, power, performance, popularity. It's one of the greatest idols that we see today. We may not have statues that we worship. But I'll tell you this. I've seen, I've seen enough. I've seen enough. <laughs> I wish I had a video. Years ago, there was a group. If you've never watched a group of boys, these two guys, I don't even know if they're still doing it or not. I haven't seen them lately, but there's two guys that used to do these videos. They're called Skip Guys. If you've never seen them, you need to go on YouTube. They're actually, they're, many of them are quite comical. But one of them's convicting down to its core. Was, he said, and, and, and as he began to talk about it, he began to say, he said, he said, I went to this, I went to this place the other day, he said, he said, there was all these people that were dressed and they were painted up and they were dancing, and he said they were dancing and cheering and they were making all these motions and movements and they were singing and dancing around these great, uh, around these great, in, in these great complexes and these great movements and they showed a group of tribal people dancing to idol worship. And then all of a sudden the screen flickers and it says, wait a minute. And then it showed people marching in the marching up to these magnificent stadiums somewhere, uh, magnificent built stadiums, and they were filling up seats, and they were painted in blue and whatever their school colors were, and they were painted, and they were dancing, and they were cheering all over the climax of this one event right here that was taking place on the field. It literally looked identical, and it was scary. It was scary at what we truly worship and find worth in. And it was that right there when Paul saw what was taking place in Athens. By the way, you know what one of the biggest events in Athens was? The Olympics or the Coliseum Games. Paul saw this. You know what happened? He was stirred that the city was I'm not against sports, folks. I promise you. But you know what it's doing? It's taking people and families out of our churches on Sundays. You know why? Because they're going and they're traveling. With all the mindset, well, my kid is going to make it to college on the sports college. The chances of that is really slim. Recognition for the for the applause, for the pat on the back, for the trophies, for the medals that will mean absolutely nothing in all eternity. Just sitting here watching, and I I can't help but think as Paul was sitting there looking at Athens, was sitting there in the midst of Athens and watching all the idolatry. I can't help but think that when he saw. What Paul saw is the same thing that spiritual eyes would see right here today. They look a little bit different, may act a little bit different. But the reality of it is, is Paul saw it and it stirred in his spirit. I want to ask you something. I want to ask you something. When you see the things that Paul saw and the way that Paul sees it, do you think, well, that's just the way it is? Or is something down deep inside? Stirred and bothered and said, I got my kids. 
I can never change anybody, but I can't have an impact on me. I can make, I, I, I can share the gospel. I can make Jesus Christ and my relationship with Jesus Christ the number one priority in my life. I can do that. When you look around, and you, are you stirred or are you just saying, well, that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. Have we become so satisfied with the environment that we're in that we feel more comfortable here than we do with heavenly things? I want us to go to the Lord in prayer and I want us to ask the Lord to stir our spirit tonight. God, as we look around and we see the craziness of the life going on around us, we see people getting challenged with, 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 with the virus. We see the government and their, and their agendas. And we see, we see all the things that are being put out and the, the theories and the opinions and all the stuff. And things are getting closed and things are getting, people are getting quarantined and everything that's happening around us. We see folks getting more, we see folks getting more upset over the fact that a ball game is getting canceled rather than the fact that education is getting put on hold. We see we're more upset about, the, about extracurricular things than we are at the fact that our church our churches are on the brink of going underground. That right now, that in certain states right now, there's certain governors, there's certain people that are doing their dead level best to try to close the door of churches. They're telling them in certain areas that they should not sing. They're telling them in certain areas that they cannot congregate. They're telling them in certain areas. Matter of fact, in one area alone that I know of right now, Lord, they have already said that a nightclub can have 500 people, but a church can't have but about 20. And so, Lord, we're looking around we see that our country and our people is consumed in idolatry. Lord, I pray that, it's, that, it, that your spirit will disagree so much that with, with your spirit within me will disagree and not fellowship, and, and I would not fellowship so much with that that it would grieve my heart and it would stir my heart to make a difference, to stand out, to speak up, and to be a difference maker. Lord, help us to turn the world upside down. Help us to do it. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church. I appreciate you being here this evening. And uh, what we're going to do, just a few quick announcements before we dismiss. Uh, we're going to have food distribution this Saturday. That is the 5th, isn't it? It's, it's, yes, yes yeah. 5th Saturday. Yeah, I'm uh, <laughs> good to know that today's Wednesday, all right? Uh, the fifth, we're going to have at nine a.m. We're going to they're, they're going to deliver everything at eight this Saturday. We're going to do the fifth and the twelfth. We're going to do all that, and it's going to get delivered here. And it, it's actually going to be in boxes, I think, this time. So we're not going to have to do near as much as we did the last time. Thank you, Jesus, because that was work. Uh, but uh, we're just throwing stuff in bags and saying, "Here you go, take this." Uh, but. Um, but they're bringing, there's another, it's another, with another company that's reached out to us that's going to try to bring us some boxes of produce, and we're going to get those out. Somewhere between 250 and 300 boxes is what they told, what I, what I figured out, but, um, or what I've come to find out. But it's going to be at 9 a.m., hopefully by, by 11, with that, that few boxes, we'll be able to get them all gone. Uh, we're going to get things posted and get it out, so if you can come help distri uh, distribute that, that will be awesome. Outside of that, we've got Sunday school at 9.30 on Sunday. Then we've got our morning worship service at 10.30. And, uh, and then uh, we've got prayer meeting at 6 on Sunday night. So as we move forward, I want you to remember those things. Other than that, church, I love you. I hope you have a blessed week. May the Lord bless you. We're just, won't be no will Saturday. I, Brother Gerald, it's like Christmas. You just, whatever we get, we get. So I don't know.